of the Old School Primitive Baptist. This is Elder D. Martin, Sr. Stay tuned for another gospel message of God's free and sovereign grace. Well, I certainly greet all of you in the name of our Lord and our Savior Jesus Christ this morning. And it is my earnest prayer that God will bless the reading of his word and give illumination and revelation to our minds as we consider it this morning and consider the subject matter at hand. I want to start by by talking about the atonement that God had had instructed Israel to provide on an annual basis for the sins of the people of Israel. For the twelve tribes of Israel, God's chosen people had a tribe called the Levites. The Levitical tribe was that which was given over for the administration of the tabernacle. And what I mean by that is that they took care of the tabernacle uh, services and of its necessities. And the tabernacle was a, a mobile uh, unit of a temple of sort with a curtain wall around it that was set up as they stopped and camped, especially as recorded uh, in the 40-year journey throughout the wilderness of which the Israelites were called to endure. Now, the Levitical tribes were also those that were given over to the priestly duties of the tabernacle as well. And the priestly duties were to take upon an annual occasion and to slay bullocks, lambs, and animals and to take their blood and to take and lay the carcasses upon the altars of God and to take and pour the blood over the carcasses and burn them as an offering unto God for the sins of the people. Now I'm trying to give you the basis of what the atonement work of God in the old covenant uh, is uh, consisting of. Because it is the basis of what we find in the New Testament, the New Covenant, that is uh, to the glory and praise of our beloved Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, and to his people. But you see, the Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews, when you read that book and its uh, entire chapters, that it is a letter to the Hebrew believers, the, the Israelites that have come into an understanding of Christ, and have believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ, and uh, are now uh, Christians. And it is written to those Hebrew or Israeli believers in Christ as to the types and shadows of those things past that have now uh, come to manifestation, or been now brought to be made clear and revealed to the believer in Christ in the New Testament and under the New Covenant. Okay, the Bible says that under the Old Testament, under the ordinances of the old carnal 
ordinances of the priesthood to, of the Levitical tribe uh, never were sins taken away. The sins of the people of God that was atoned for through the carnal priesthood of the Levitical tribe of Israel was only a temporary covering for their sins that had to be done annually and with that atonement of the blood and the carcasses of animals where sin was never eradicated or forgotten about but was remembered year by year. But the Bible says in Hebrews that Jesus Christ had come into this world manifesting himself as the Lamb of God, which in the purpose and sovereign, almighty, uh, decreed, determined purpose of God was slain before the foundation of the world in God's predestined purpose, that he, Christ, would be the ultimate sacrifice for the sins of God's people. And not only the twelve tribes of Israel under the Old Testament uh, and the Old Covenant, but to all of those that make up the Israel of God in this day, a new dispensation under the New Testament and New Covenant made up of every tongue, kindred, and nation of people on earth. What I'm saying to you is that God has completed his Old Testament promises in and through the children of Israel and the Levitical priesthood. He has completed that and, and set that forth as a type and shadow of that which was to come in the person of his son Jesus Christ. And then that's why we have the Old Testament and the New Testament. A testament is a Declaration of Promises. The old declaration of promises to the children of Israel were that if you take and do what I've instructed you to do in taking and bringing sacrifices to the, to the Levitical priest to be offered up for the sins of, of the people of the twelve tribes, uh, this will be used as an atonement uh, and a covering for sin. But as I said, uh, on a temporary basis, year by year, it had to be done. But in the New Testament, now this New Testament, new promises, the Bible says by a new and living way, God has brought in His Son, Jesus Christ, that through His atonement, atonement on the cross of Calvary, that once and for all, once and for all of God's children, no matter where they may be and who they are, regarding nationality, tongue, kindred, and nation, chosen in Christ by God the Father and given to Jesus to seek and to save, they shall have their sins not only atoned for, but eradicated which means to be removed and erased. The Bible says that in the New Testament that God shall remove our sins as far as the east is from the west. How far is that? You can't find the end of it. God shall take our sins and cast them behind him and never to be remembered again. That is a blessed and wonderful promise. Now I'm talking about sin of past present, and future. To God's elect children, chosen in Christ Jesus, that have been atoned for by His sacrificial, vicarious uh, giving of Himself on the cross of Calvary, being nailed there by the cruel and wicked hands of men, according to the determinate counsel of God, according to Acts chapter 2, Jesus Christ paid for all of God's people's sins once and for all. And so therefore, we can rejoice today 
in that gospel good news. That's what the gospel is. You look up the word gospel in its original language in the Greek and it is determined as good news and the right message, the true message. The gospel of Jesus Christ is the right message and good news. If we had to, listen to me, if we have to do something to appease God by works of our own righteousness and by our duty and our obligation to God in order to stay in a good standing with God in this time world as we live, if we have to do something, then Christ came in vain and he died in vain. But his sacrifice on the cross was not in vain, but it was to accomplish something. And that something was that it was to redeem a people unto God uh, once and for all. Now let me read to you some scriptures. Now I'm going to jump around because I'm not taking, I'm going to use a context. Uh, but I guess I could probably start in, in Hebrews and read to you. Uh, as a springboard of the priesthood of Christ. And then we'll look at the atonement. Right, let, me, let me begin reading in Hebrews chapter 7. Okay, Hebrews chapter 7, if you got your Bibles, you want to follow me, please feel free to do so. Hebrews chapter 7, and verse 19. For the law made nothing perfect. Now the law of God has made nothing perfect. The Bible says that uh, Paul writes to the believers in uh, Galatia, in the, in the Galatian church, he writes, he says, For by the law shall no flesh or no man be justified. For by the law is the revelation of, the, of sinfulness of man. For by the law comes the knowledge of sin. For the law was given to reveal man's sinfulness. The law was never given to make a man righteous. For the law could never do that because man could never keep it to the point that where it would appease God Almighty unto its perfection. You look at the Ten Commandments, for instance. We call them the Ten Moral Laws of God given to men. You look at the Ten Commandments and see if you have kept every one of them in your life. If you haven't, then you've fallen short of the glory of God and of the perfection of God, and you are a sinner. The Bible says all have sinned, not a few. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory and the perfection of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. They've all gone astray, the Bible says in Romans chapter 3. But the Bible says, and as I repeated, that for the law made nothing perfect. But the law in itself is perfect and still is today. It is perfect in what it's determined to do and what it's to accomplish. And that too is to accomplish uh, the revelation of man's sinfulness before a holy and a righteous God. And the Bible says, the Apostle Paul writes, and he says also in, uh, in Galatians, he says, for the law is our schoolmaster, which is interpreted as our teacher, until faith came, and then the, no longer is the law or schoolmaster needed. When faith comes unto one, and they see by face I Christ as their advocate and their substitute in their behalf for their sinfulness, then therefore the law, it has no more uh, uh, finger pointed at us, saying unto us, Cursed are ye that are sinful. Because Christ's blood it cleanses us from all unrighteousness. In verse 19 of chapter 7 of Hebrews, for the law made nothing perfect, listen, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God, inasmuch as not without an oath he was made priest, talking about Christ. For those priests, talking about those of the old covenant, those 
priests were under an oath, but this an oath by him that said unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent. Thou art a priest after the order of Melchizedek. In other words, he's talking about that, that Jesus Christ is going to come as a priest that is not under the carnal ordinance of the priesthood of the Levitical tribe, but is a priest unto himself and for a particular person, and he alone is the ultimate, as the Bible calls him, our high priest. The Bible says that, it says in verse 22, For by so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. Now, I'll stop right there a minute. Jesus Christ was made a surety. You know what a surety is? I think most of you do. Uh, when somebody gives you a, a document uh, as a, a piece of uh, uh, written uh, document that says this is a surety, it is in essence a guarantee. That's what surety means. The Bible says that but, uh, Jesus Christ was made a surety or guarantee of a better testament. And again, I said the testament merely means promises. Uh, and we're under the new promises of God. And so therefore, we have a guarantee that God has brought in a new promise to those that are blessed to believe upon Christ. And the Bible goes on to say that, and they truly were many priests, back under the old Levitical priesthood. But they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. In other words, the priests under the Levitical priesthood of the Old Covenant, Old Testament, they perished as carnal men. They died to death, and there had to be another priest that was uh, confirmed to take on the, and continue on to the perpetual work of the tabernacle and the offering up of the sacrifices. But the Bible says, but this man, verse 24, this man, Jesus, because he continueth ever. Oh, I'm glad he continueth ever, beloved brethren and sisters. This man, Jesus, that continueth forever, have an unchangeable priesthood. His priesthood doesn't change, has not changed, and will not change. Now the carnal priesthood changed. It changed from, from man to man, from priest to priest, as they, were, as they were consecrated, and then as they went through their life, as pre, doing their priestly duties, and then the, they died the death, and another took his place. But this man, Jesus who liveth forever, have an unchangeable priesthood, in verse 25, wherefore he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him. And Jesus Christ said in chapter, four, chapter 14 of John's Gospel, verse 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man come to the Father but by me. Therefore, if you come to God, by Jesus Christ, through Jesus Christ, the Bible says that he shall save you to the uttermost to all them that come to him in and through Jesus Christ. Seeing that he ever liveth to make intercession for them. Jesus Christ when he ascended into glory after his 40 days, after his resurrection, was seen of more than 500 brethren, the Bible says. He was seen of the brethren in the book of Acts, chapter 2, carried up into the clouds up, up into heaven. And the angels of God stood there saying to these men of Galilee, Oh, why do you stand there gazing upward for this same Jesus that you have seen ascend into the clouds? He is coming back again. Jesus Christ has ascended into heaven's glory. The Bible says, and is seated at the right hand of God the Father, making intercession for us continually, perpetually. That word perpetual means uh, 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 self-containing or uh, without, uh, without any out outside uh, uh, required power or... Uh, 
parts added to it. Christ by himself had taken upon himself all of the sins of God's people down through the ages of time. Listen to this verse. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For God had made him, Jesus, who knew no sin to become sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Now, brothers and sisters, that is a beautiful scripture. That Jesus Christ, who knew no sin, and as the Bible says, Jesus was tempted in every way, yet without sin. He took upon himself all the sins of God's elect, chosen, ordained, appointed heirs of grace. Down through the ages of time, out of every tongue, kindred, and nation that God had chosen in Christ to be given to him in time, that would be his sheepfold, that as he said in John chapter 10, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and they follow me. He didn't say they were going to try to, or they were going to give an, be given an opportunity to, but the Bible says that Jesus said, My sheep hear my voice and they follow me. Others, uh, they will not follow. For I am the good shepherd and my sheep know my voice. And the Bible says that to them that stood around about him that rejected his word, he said, huh, You hear not my voice because you are not of my sheepfold. And the Bible says that he that be of God, heareth God's word. And he that be not of God, heareth not the words of God, neither can they know him. The Bible goes on to say, whereas he is able to save them which come to him, to the uttermost. It says, for such a high priest, in verse 26, became us. For such a high priest became us, he come amongst us, the Bible says. It says, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. Jesus Christ was separate from sinners as far as being uh, in like manner in behavior as the rest of mankind. Yet he was amongst sinners. He ate and supped with sinners. He preached to sinners. He loved sinners, and he's come to give himself for sinners, yet he himself was not a sinner. He was sinless and spotless, and as I said before, uh, him being tempted in every way, yet without sin. And then the Bible says in verse 27, Who needeth not daily, as those high priests of the times before, to offer up sacrifice, first for his own sins, and then for the sins of the people, for this did Jesus he did once when he offered up himself now let me clear up some smoke if there's any at all around in regarding this matter Jesus Christ though he was taken by the wicked and cruel hands of men according to the determinate counsel of God Almighty he was taken because he willfully gave himself to them to be the sacrifice that God had sent him to do and provide for his people. That's why Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, he kneeled, he kneeled down there and he prayed to the Father, Father, uh, uh, he was overcome with anguish and with uh, anxiety because he knew what was before him. He knew that the cross was the end result of his ministry here on earth. Jesus knew that. He says, he says, Father, you know, take this cup from me, this cup of suffering that I've got to partake of in behalf of your people and your elect children here in this time world. Oh, God, but then the Bible says, but Jesus says, but nevertheless, not my will be done, but thine. Not my will, but thine. And the Bible says in one of the Gospels, it says that there was a numeral amount of angels that came and ministered to Christ at that particular moment. And 
and, and undergirded him by the strength of the Spirit of the Almighty. You see, the Son of Man was that which was crying out in anguish, but the Son of God, deity part of Jesus Christ, uh, was ministered to by the angelic host, and he was then given peace and uh, about what he had to do. You remember when Pilate said to him, he says, uh, well, what, the, he said to the people, what shall we do with this man? I find no fault in him. And they said, crucify him. He said, what? Crucify him. Why? I don't find no fault in him. It was God's determined purpose that Christ be crucified. No man could stop or alter that. Brother Scott, if someone could have stopped that and altered Christ from going to the cross, we're still in our sins today. We're under the Old Covenant, Old Testament. We better find us a priest that can kill a bullock, a lamb, and offer up his body on an on a altar and pour its blood over its body and burn it in our behalf annually or we're in deep trouble. No, but Jesus Christ came and gave himself. He gave himself willfully before that council and before Pilate. And he said to Pilate, he said, for, for no man has the power to take my life from me, for I give it up for you. He gave his life blood for our behalf. Voluntarily, sacrificially, vicariously. Now, let me get down, let me get down to the core of this matter and talk about the blood of Jesus Christ. If, there's a, if there is a gospel to ever be preached that is exempt from the blood of Christ, it is not a gospel of good news. If there is a gospel that is preached that talks about how men can be good enough to please God and it's exempt of the person and the uh, sacrifice of Jesus Christ, it is not a true gospel. It's not a sound gospel. It is not a gospel of good news towards those who are under it. But the Bible says in Matthew chapter 26, this is when Jesus was there and he was taken, partaking of the Last Supper with the disciples. He says, for this is my blood of the New Testament. He was talking about that, that cup of wine. He says to you, my beloved twelve brethren here, the disciples of Christ that was with him. He said, this is the blood. He said, this is the blood of the New Testament. The old has gone away. It's waxed old and has been removed. This is the blood of the New Testament in its symbol here in this cup of wine. He says this is the blood of the New Testament which is shed for many. Now, he didn't say it was shed for the world. Let me clarify that. Let the scriptures interpret scripture. We have a message going around that Jesus Christ died on the cross, paid for the sins of all of mankind. Now listen to me. If that be the truth, then there is no essence on believing on him. If he has paid for the sins of all mankind, all mankind have got their sins removed by this God, and there's no sense in having to believe on him or to live uh, consecrated to him and uh, loving him as our Savior if we believe that he died for all mankind, then we're automatically going to heaven, and that's it. But the Bible says, Jesus said, this is shed, the blood which I am telling you about here in type, in this cup, is a symbol that, of the blood that I'm going to shed for many. Now, the many is not the totality of mankind. But the Bible says, for the remission of sins. Now, in Acts 20, 28, the Bible says that it is the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. The blood of Jesus Christ was sacrificed by him on that cross to purchase a particular people, which is called the church of Jesus Christ. They make up the church of Jesus Christ. Now, now let me talk about the church of Jesus Christ. There is the church locally and the church collectively, which is worldwide. But nevertheless, whether it's locally 
or worldwide, the Church of Christ is that which is a called out local assembly of people who have professed to believe on Jesus Christ as their Savior and that their hope is laid totally within His sacrificial work for their sins to be forgiven and to inherit life eternal. And then collectively, it is those assemblies that are here and yonder, around the world, that are made up of those same type of people, caused to believe on Christ. I say caused, for blessed is the man whom God has chosen and causes to approach him to thee, the Bible says. And to all that believe on Christ, make up the church collectively and worldwide. It does not have a particular name other than it is the Church of Jesus Christ Worldwide. In this particular gathering, it is the Fellowship Primitive Baptist Church of Wyomama, Florida, of to where, listen now, to where uh, the believers in Christ Jesus come together uh, in attempt to worship Him in spirit and in truth. You take the believers individually mortal men, women, boys and girls out of here and take them out yonder and empty this house out, you don't have a church here. All you've got is a meeting house. The meeting house only becomes a church when the believers in Christ enter into it and they begin to enter into worship, whether it's singing, uh, preaching, praying, prophesying, whether it's... uh, testify whatever it be. The Bible says that in Hebrews 9 verse 14, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? That's a question that Paul was asking them. How much more now? Are we to to, to draw nigh unto God and to love Him who has given Himself for us and has without spot nor wrinkle purged us by His blood? And then in 1 Peter uh, verse uh, 18 of chapter 1 it says this, For as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things, such as the carcasses of uh, bulls and and uh, goats and lambs and things of the old covenant, but the Bible says that uh, that uh, such as uh, were of the times past, uh, from your vain conversation or your vain activity. That word conversation is is interpreted in the Greek as a lifestyle. It does not mean necessarily verbal communication, but in many instances, converse conversation is translated as lifestyle or by the the style of your life. It says, it is not by those ways and means of things that were past, but is is now uh, by the precious blood of Christ, verse 19 of 1 Peter, chapter 1, as a lamb without blemish and without spot. We have been redeemed by the precious blood of Christ that was shed without spot and without blemish. Christ's blood was perfect blood. You listen to me. He was born of a virgin Mary, conceived of the Holy Ghost of God. Yea, though he had a human body, God had purposed her to be the vessel of which he would implant his Holy Spirit to cause that holy seed to come forth and and be the baby Jesus Christ who grew to be the God-man Jesus. This man, Jesus Christ, who ministered to the age of possibly about 30, 32 to 33 years old, possibly. He preached and taught for three or four years from his home area of Nazareth and began to preach and teach the gospel of which God had given him and had sent him to preach. For the Bible says in Matthew chapter 1 that the angels of God told Joseph even before he was born because Joseph was embarrassed that Mary was pregnant And he knew that he had had nothing to do with her physically. He did not know her, the Bible says, Brother Gus. That means he did not have any intimate relationship with that virgin Mary 
And here she comes up pregnant. And he was embarrassed about this and didn't know how to react to the situation. And uh, the angels of God said, Behold, Joseph, for that which is in the womb of, of uh, thy beloved Mary is the God-man. And that his name is to be called Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. He was comforted with that. I tell you, when an angel comes down and speaks to you, brother, and uh, he'll get your attention, uh, you ain't going to say, oh, well, I don't know whether this is true or not. You're going to be made to believe it's a true thing. And he went away, and he took that precious woman, and he took, and they went away as a married couple, and they went to that lonely place, that inn where there was no room for anybody else, but they went out there to that lowly stable, that place where there was a manger, where, where, where the livestock fed out of, brother. And there was that baby Jesus that laid there in a human mortal body form. He laid there in a feed trough, brother. And, and that's where Jesus laid at and was uh, begotten into this time realm. The Bible goes on to say, let me continue on, it says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, But if we walk in the light as he is the light, Jesus is the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sins. If we walk in the light. Are you walking in the light? What does, what does the gospel message that Jesus Christ came to seek and save sinners and give his lifeblood in their behalf do for you? Does that, does that cause you to feel a rejoicing in heart that it is for you personally? I hope so. The Bible goes on to say in Revelation 1.5, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, and to him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. The blood of Jesus Christ. It's just like that song. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath that blood, lose all their guilty stains. Not some of them but all of them. And that's what is so blessed and wonderful about the gospel of Jesus Christ is that it is not, it is not a message that man has to do something and continue to do something to, to appease God and to, to continually be in, in good standards with God. The message truth is the matter of, is that Christ had came once and for all gave himself and redeemed the people. That means he purchased them back unto himself, and never to be eradicated or altered from that. What Christ's blood paid for is going to be actually, uh, in essence, uh, the redeeming uh, symbol of everything that's required of God. When Christ looks upon us as individuals, as believers in his son Jesus, and, and he looks upon us as mortal beings that are sinful by nature, he sees us, listen, filtered through the blood of his son. And Jesus is the high priest, the Bible says, seated at the right hand of God the Father, making intercession for us, which I read to you from Hebrews. He is there right now, making intercession for all of God's elect people. There ain't nothing we can do that Jesus Christ will not stand up in our behalf and say, Father, they are mine. They are mine. My blood has purchased them. My blood has bought them. My blood has redeemed them. My blood has washed them and cleansed them from all unrighteousness. All, oh, listen, yes. The Bible says, finally, it says in Revelation 7, verse 14, in regarding the, the makeup of those in heaven to glory, it says, These are they which came out of 
the great tribulation down here in this world below. This is a great tribulation. You know that? That living in this mortal realm is a tribulation in itself. That we have discouragements, disappointments, heartaches, hurt feelings, broken emotions, loss of loved ones. We become a spouse to one and then all of a sudden in time is to come, they're taken from us. Oh, for the widow and the widowed among the society of the, uh, the church of Jesus Christ. There's been sadness and grief there, has there not? But it says that to those who have come through the great tribulation of this time mortal realm here below, that have walked the pilgrimage as sojourners and strangers in this time world here below, it says, and have washed their robes and been made white in the blood of Christ. We shall stand in that day upon that great transition time when these mortal bodies shall be transformed immortal. And the Bible says that we shall be made incorruptible, that which is corrupt by uh, the inheritance of uh, Adam's nature. We are by nature corrupt, sinful, wretched human beings. And these bodies are corrupt and tainted with that same curse through the blood of that one that brought upon mankind the sinful nature. He was the federal head of mankind uh, as far as our, our natures are <coughs> under the curse of sin. That Christ came to break the chains loose and set the prisoners free who were in bondage to sin and the dominion thereof. The Bible says that they that believe on Jesus Christ are no longer under the bondage of sin. In other words, they should not and shall not. I believe that as a testimony of this to those who have professed to believe in Christ, they do not live any longer under the dominion of sin. That does not mean that we're sinless in our mortal walk. It means that we do not live in a sinful manner as a means of lifestyle. Well, as we once did before. We walk to a different drum beat. The Bible says, Blessed are they that hear the joyful sound and rejoice therein. The joyful sound of what? That Jesus Christ came to give his lifeblood for sinners. And to every man, woman, boy, and girl that gives himself uh, uh, to, the, to the message of that good news and is able to hear it by God's sovereign, free, and loving kindness and sovereign grace. That everyone is able to hear the message, that, and it becomes a joyful sound within their heart, mind, and soul. Uh, praise be to God, for God has done a work in your heart and in your mind and in your soul. But yet that same message can go out as it has in times past in great meetings, whether it was Billy Graham preaching or some other minister or evangelist preaching to a large uh, uh, group of people, uh, wherever it was on television, wherever it might be, yet there is going to be uh, a percentage, and on the most part, the biggest percentage of the folks under the sound of the gospel of Christ that cannot really hear nor endorse the truth. Because Jesus said, many shall be called, but few shall be chosen. The gospel call has gone out. We have listened, we have lived, Brother Scott, in the best of the best of times. You of an older generation than me, we have lived in the best of the best. You can remember out there, no doubt, when there was mules and horses plowing ground around here. It ain't no more. You can remember when going out and trying to herd up livestock was a, a chore that seemed like to be unending. But it's easier today with means and methods. We have lived in the best of the best. And we are now under the strain of economical uh, oppression in this country like never before. 
Well, I say never before. In the Great Depression, it was it was a, it was a terrible time. But yet, in in sense, we are uh, almost to that degree in regard to what we have had 25 years ago. We are suffering. We are tightening up. We are we are losing ground here uh, with what we have been used to having. We are a materialistic people that have been forced into an individualistic mold that has made us who we are as a nation, and we are paying the price for it. And God's judgment is being poured out upon this land now. And we have yet more to suffer, I believe. And only by the grace of God and the mercy of God shall the church of Jesus Christ be spared from the devastation of this. And I'm telling you, folks, with the signs of the times as we see them today, that Jesus Christ's return and that great advent that is prophesied in the scriptures to yet occur, I believe is on the brink of happening. I believe that. That just as it says in 1 Thessalonians 4, that the Lord himself shall descend from the heavens with a shout and with the voice of an archangel, with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall be raised from the grave. Every one that has been caused to believe on Christ that's in this graveyard cemetery out yonder. In that day, when the voice of the Son of God shall be trumpeted forward and called out from the grave of the dead, they shall be raised up and made immortal and incorruptible to stand before God as His elect children and the church of Jesus Christ universally. And it's coming to pass, uh, I believe, soon. You say, well, yes, don't the Bible say that there has been many in times past that where is this coming? Yes, there has been. There's been many scoffers, many that criticize where is this prophecy. We've got folks that are now trying to set dates. As you know, there was a date set here this uh, past month uh, by one who set that same, same advent to happen in 1994. Matter of fact, I know the preacher. I met him in, in the early 90s at a Bible conference. And, and he, uh, he thinks he has chronologically, mathematically, able to take and come down through the scriptures and put a time and a date on the coming of Christ when Jesus said in his book, he said, For no man knoweth the day nor the hour of the coming of the Son of Man. No man knoweth. And so, anybody comes up with these prophecies, let, let me say to you, don't be so gullible, deceived, to think that these men know a date or a time. Jesus said, no man knows it except the Father. He's going to come as a thief in the night. Now, if you knew when a thief in the night was coming to your house, wouldn't you be ready for him? And, and you would know the time it was coming? But a thief in the night comes at a time that you're not thinking about it. You're not expecting him. Oh, God help us to be expecting him to come. May we be those that are living in a time and an era to where we're looking for that blessed time and the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ to come in all his glory and to send from the heavens with a shout, sending his holy angels to the four winds to gather together his elect church out of every tongue, kindred, and nation. Yes, I've tried to set before you uh, of the importance and of the necessity of the blood of Jesus Christ today and its divine purpose and that it has fulfilled all of what God has determined it to do and that is to redeem a people unto himself and that can never be altered or changed. For when the Bible says that God has given to Christ a people whose names are written in the Lamb's Book of Life before the foundation of the world, what is there to be said about that? If he wrote their names in the Lamb's Book of Life before the foundation of the world, that means before the world had a foundation, I believe, before the sun had its brilliance, before the, the orbits of the planets were in their place, and before creation was complete, God the Father had written the names 
of his people in his son's book of life. That he would come, pay the ultimate price for their sins in their behalf, to redeem them unto God the Father forever and eternity. Therefore we have eternal life in and through and by Jesus Christ and him alone. To him be the glory, the praise, and the honor without end. Pray with me, would you please? Father, our God, in the name of your darling Son, Jesus, we thank you, Lord, for the privilege we've had to meet together, to sing the songs that we pray, God, were worshipful to thee. We pray, dear God, that the word that was set forth this morning would profit, Lord, those that be here, that those who are here will have hearing ears to hear it and endorse it and believe it and receive it into the hearts and minds. And we pray, dear God, that our Lord Jesus Christ has been seen in a more clear and more precise and perfect uh, view in the mind's eye uh, by faith this morning. We pray, dear God, that you'll bless us in the days ahead. Keep us, O oh God, looking for that time when Jesus Christ is going to descend from the heavens with a shout and with the voice of our king. Help us, O oh God, to, to not to forsake of the assembling ourselves together uh, in this time as we see the, those days approaching as the Apostle Paul admonishes the church. Lord, help us to be uh, caring one for another. Help us to desire fellowship one with another in love and in kindness. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen.